Hello and welcome to Crux Investor. First of all, thank you so much for watching this program. If you like it, give us a thumbs up. That helps us understand if this is the sort of program you think we should be producing for you. You can also leave your comments below. It uh, helps us with the sorts of questions you think we should be asking. I think we've done, of course, what you thought of Marimaka Copper. You can catch this as a podcast, transcription, or article on cruxinvestor.com. And of course, for our Crux Investor Club members, you get early access to this video, training sessions, and commentary from experts from all around the world, and a bunch of other stuff. So if you could also click the button in the corner of the screen to subscribe to our YouTube channel, if you haven't already done so. And of course, for more videos like this one, click the notification bell. We spoke earlier today to Hayden Locke, who is the president of Marimaka Copper. We last caught up with Hayden when he was CEO at Emerson, but he's been brought in to help kind of clean up the balance sheet here, uh, deal with some of the debt issues and look at fundraising and market facing activity here at Marimaka. Their PA came out recently, some quite good results actually, uh, not bad at all. Um, however, they are changing their plans. Um, they're going to focus a little bit more on the exploration upside because that potentially could change this from a very good project to a world-class project in their opinion. So we talked about the business plan, how they hope to deliver it, some of the things that he has been up to uh, in the past six months before joining um, Marimaka. Um, we look forward to a world post-COVID and what that could look like. So interesting conversation, interesting company. Take a look in the description below at some of the topics we discuss. Anything interesting in particular, click on the number beside that topic. That's a timestamp and that'll jump you through to that part of the interview. Otherwise, sit back and enjoy what Hayden has to say. Hayden, how are you doing, sir? Well, thank you for having me back. Yeah, you're back, but you're wearing a different hat today. Last time we spoke, you were CEO of Emerson Potash Company, uh, but that's all changed. Where are you now? It has. Uh, you would have hopefully seen the announcement that uh, I was replaced as the CEO of Emerson by a mine building potash executive who has a lot of operational experience. Makes a lot of sense given the transition of that company. Uh, I've been working with uh, Marimaka Copper for a good little while in the background in any case, and they offered me a role, which I accepted. So, yeah, I'm joining uh, you today with Marimaka Copper. Fantastic. So we're going to see a new story to us and we're going to hear uh, all about it. Let's kick off with that one minute overview and then we'll pick it up from there. We're developing a copper project in northern Chile, so a tier one mining jurisdiction and you know, very well known for the copper industry. This is a really unique project. Uh, it's got very low capital cost to production. You know how much I love low capital cost to production. I think it's one of the uh, one of the banes of our industry is that so many projects are so high capital cost. And in this one, We've got industry leading low capital cost to production. Uh, it is also a, a very low cost project uh, in terms of operating cost across the life of mine. Um, and so it really, even in today's prices, and yes, copper prices are up, but even in today's prices, this is going to be a mine, which is what I really like about it. But I think the thing that really got me most excited about joining Marimaka is the exploration potential attaching to it. Uh, so we know we've got a great project. It underpins our valuation today, but the exploration potential around the project is is absolutely enormous, and we'll be looking at testing that in the coming months. Okay, we'll come to all of that in a minute. But first of all, first question people are going to be asking is, why have you been brought in? What's the problem you've been brought in to try and solve? Well, there's no real problem. It's just that the management team, the operational management team, are based in Santiago in Chile, and uh, you know, with companies like of our scale and our size. Uh, we know that there's there's a strong need for a market-facing role. Um, so I'm here to uh, get out in front of the market and tell the story and meet investors and uh, and organise the financing side of the business. Uh, but equally, the other side of it is this project is, uh, as I said, very unique. It's one of the only copper discoveries, new copper discoveries made in the last five years. And as you can imagine, there is quite a lot of strategic interest in this project. Uh, and my background as an investment banker helps me on that side uh, to understand the strategic uh, the strategic rationale and, and how we're going to build our strategy to, to maximise value for shareholders. Okay, well, I think therein lies a bit of a clue because um, you've had to kind of sort out the balance sheet a little bit in terms of obviously COVID's impact, uh, cost structures. Um, you've had to negotiate with Greenstone with regards to the convertible notes. So I assume you've been involved in both of those components. Can you just talk us through the numbers Fight the financial numbers, please. So, yeah, you're absolutely right. There's been a lot of restructuring that's gone on since I've been involved. Um, and I think it's important to point out that that debt that that we uh, that Greenstone converted was actually not anything to do with the Marimaka project itself. It was to do with another development stage project. It was non-recourse to the company, uh, but 
notwithstanding that, because we own the subsidiary, it was consolidated into our balance sheet. It caused a lot of confusion. And so, you know, as a company, we made the decision to ask Greenstone uh, to convert that debt and therefore take it off our balance sheet, which they gladly did. Um, so right now, in terms of debt, uh, actual debt, we have a working capital facility, which was provided by Greenstone uh, to us when coronavirus hit, just to allow us to not have to raise equity capital at, at that very low price we were when the coronavirus pandemic started. Uh, so that's a $6 million facility. Uh, that gets us right through to the end of the year. Um, and then in terms of other debt or liabilities on the balance sheet, we have some uh, we have some option payments on our land remaining that needs to be paid over the next 18 months. Uh, it comes to about $9 million, a bit over $9 million. Okay, so there's a fair bit of tidying up today. So let's be clear, that was $19.2 million bucks which you removed from your balance sheet with the, with the Greenstone deal. But tell me about that. Did they want to convert or was it a case of you didn't have the financial wherewithal to be able to meet the terms and repay them? And in which case it was a reluctant conversion or was that did they come gladly skipping into the project? No, it wasn't a reluctant conversion. They were, they were always intending on converting that debt into equity in the subsidiary code. It's relating to another project uh, called the Berta project. Um, and so, you know, really it was non-core for the Maramaka uh, company as we see it, the new Maramaka, as I'm, as I'm talking about it, where we've rebranded it from Coro Mining to Maramaka, where our exclusive focus is really on the Maramaka project. And so, you know, Greenstone, we're very happy to, to convert that debt and then take that, uh, that asset uh, basically under their umbrella. So that so they've taken um, what uh, Nova and SCM, I think, Sociedad so Sensual, uh, Minera, Berta. Where are they as an equity holder in Maramaca then? Where are they up to now? So they own about 24% of the head code, of the list code. Right. Uh, and they prior to that, they owned about 58%, but they inspecied out a lot of those shares to their underlying LPs. Uh, so they're now those shares are now in the hands of their LPs uh, you know, which which means those LPs have voting rights over those, uh, and then the the other large shareholder is Tembo Capital, another private equity fund. Both out of London. Um, well, I, I assume you're dealing with the London uh, guys. Um, so, so you did break down some of the other moving parts there, the other debt uh, components. So just go over those again for me. Just want to sort of understand where they're at, how difficult they will be to. Um, manage. We have a working capital facility uh, of a total of $6 million, which is uh, we've drawn about $4 million and we have a bit over, a bit under $2 million left on the balance sheet for that. That's really to allow us to fund ourselves to the end of the year without needing to raise capital. Right. Um, I think I haven't had this discussion with Greenstone, but I, I assume the intention would be that Greenstone and Tembo would roll uh, that working capital facility into any capital raise we do. Um, and then in addition to that, there are option payments still due on the land at Maramaka, uh, of which about $6 million is due in the next 12 months uh, from our last accounts, and then $3.6 million due uh, post that. Okay, great. Okay, thank you for that. Um, so what are you going to do about it? We obviously have to raise capital at some point uh, and, uh, and pay off those uh, variety of, uh, of liabilities owing. Um, the benefit we have is we have two large private equity funds that have basically been fi- financing this business by themselves for the last uh, couple of years, uh, you know, really keen to stand their ground. They see the value in the project. So I don't think raising new capital is going to be an issue. But one of the things we are looking to address as a company is just uh, the number of institutions we have on the register and uh, the free float available to buy shares. Um, it's probably one of the things that's holding us back is just that overall uh, capital structure in terms of shares and where they're held. So and how are you going to address that? So we'll eventually we'll go out and raise capital from the market, I would, I would expect. Uh, but in terms of getting the balance right between institutional and retail, I mean, how do you manage that is the question? Well, we have, we have a fairly reasonable chunk of shares in the hands of retail right now. Uh, and so at the moment, my job is really focused on getting out in front of uh, institutions. And then uh, we are pushing out towards more retail discussions. And so that's through brokers, broker dealers, uh, platforms like this. Uh, you know, we'll, we'll uh, start doing more video format uh, interviews and things to get out in front of the retail crowd. But what I found, which I, f- I found really interesting uh, when I joined and started marketing the company is very few institutions and the big institutions that are big players in this, in this space, very few of them have heard the story. They kind of know a little bit about Coro and now Maramaka, or they've heard something but when we actually present the story to them, they're like, 
this is not what I remember it being when we when we last met this company. So, uh, you know, I think there's a lot of a lot of groups that we can still meet and a lot of work that we can do on the on the marketing front. Yeah, you'd, you'd hope it wasn't the same story they'd heard previously. Um, you obviously the share price. Is, uh, the The reaction to the PEA has been extremely strong. Your share price is up as high as it's it's been in three and a half years. So um, obviously very positive reaction to that. Do you want to kind of remind the audience of some of the numbers that you've hit there? Because I think it was pretty good. Yeah, it was, a, it was a very, I think it surprised us as a management team. We knew it was going to be an interesting project. Uh, so to, to some of the highlights, pre-production capital costs of 285 million US dollars uh, with a capital intensity of about $7,000 a ton of copper cathode uh, capacity. I mean, that's right down in the bottom quartile of capital intensity. Um, which we know is so important in terms of having a, a good return on your invested capital on developing these projects. It's a 12-year life of mine producing on average over the life of mine about 35, 36,000 tonnes of copper cathode. Uh, we have an early stage uh, up front of five or six years of pretty much bang on 40,000 tonnes a year of copper cathode. Uh, our C1 cash costs bang in the middle of the second quarter, uh, but the benefit of this project, which is an open pit, and then heat leach SXCW is the sustaining capital to keep this project running is so much lower than uh, what you would see for a, a huge sub-level block cave or something like that. So our all-in sustaining cash costs uh, are right in the bottom quartile, which is what I always look for is, you know, how much cash are we going to make from these businesses to manufacturing business? Yeah, I guess it's, you'll know more as you proceed. I mean, the economic PEA is, you know, it's, it's still early days, but talk to me about the metallurgical component because... Um, I want to understand, you know, are you going to be hindered by what you see there? Because you, you talked about indications, but how much more work have you got to do? That's actually a really good point because, you know, this PEA that has been complete is a PEA because there is inferred resource included in the mine plan. Uh, one of the things that struck me when I went down to Santiago and visited with the team was they are well advanced on many, many of the technical aspects of this project, including the metallurgical testing. So there's already been three phases of metallurgical testing complete. Uh, the fourth phase is just about to be complete. And, you know, we had a call recently with one of our uh, MET consultants who's got 35 plus years experience. And he was saying, you know, basically where we are now is pretty much at a level that would be bankable uh, for any project finance banks coming in and looking at this. So we've done a lot of work um, you know, really narrowing down how we'll process it, how much acid's going to be needed, uh, how, what, the, what the leach kinetics are like. So actually, in terms of the overall project, we're far more advanced in many aspects than a typical PEA. It's just that last sort of 35% of the resource not being an indicator that is the reason why this is still called a PEA. Um, so on the processing side, on the, on the, uh, on the metallurgical side, the first three phases, there are five distinct subzones of mineralization in, uh, and the dominant zones are the green oxides, your classic green oxides in this part of the world. And they tend to process exceptionally well um, on exposure to acid. They have high acid solubilities and they tend to, uh, you tend to get up to those acid solubilities in your leach work fairly quickly. Um, so we're very confident on the recoveries in those areas and we've done quite a bit of test work on those areas. The remaining three mineral subzones have quite a bit of variability between them, and that's part of the phase four MET testing uh, that we're doing. Some of them have lower acid solubilities, uh, but in general, what we're seeing is a fairly good uh, profile of leaching and a fairly high recovery of the total acid, a total copper content uh, in our leaching test work, which is done in mini columns, 1.5 meter columns. Uh, so. We've done a huge amount of work and we're fairly comfortable with the assumptions in the PEA at this point. Okay. And you'll, as you know more, I guess you'll announce to the marketplace as that process continues. Um, I want to talk about, again, so almost coming back to you and why, when you came in, you've got a team of very technical people there. You've got quite a reasonable size project now, even at this stage. Um, there's going to be a sort of clash of cultures in a way, usually, because you're, you've got to, you've been brought in to kind of commercialise this um, company. And what's going on up here with you? I mean, what do you think the plan needs to be? Because you've, you've got an appreciation of what the market needs to hear. They're beavering away technically and, and sounds like they're delivering as well, which is great news. But what have you come together and agreed the plan is going forward for the build out of this 
company, not necessarily into a mind, but for the company so that the market can actually appreciate the value that you're trying to create? Yeah, well, I think until we put out the announcement on the uh, potential for sulfides at uh, the Maramaca oxide deposit, so the deep sulfide potential below the Maramaca oxide deposit, the intention was to go full bore forwards to develop this project, move as quickly as we could to get it into production and, and get ourselves cash flowing because it is a mine that can be built and it's fairly low execution risk. And, you know, from my perspective, uh, my skill set actually complements the CEO, Luis Tondo's skill set exceptionally well. He's he's highly technical and, and a, a real mine builder. Uh, and I work more on the finance side. So we actually uh, have a great working relationship in terms of uh, how we divide up what's going on in the company. Um, I think what's changed a little bit is this expiration, potential expiration upside that we've seen. And we, we've seen enough that we think that there could be something game changing for the company. Um, and so we've had this actual debate this week with the board about what's our strategy going forward, how much are we going to devote to continuing to move the Maramaca project forward, how much are we going to devote to expiration. And I think the conclusion that we've come to is we need to continue to move Maramaca towards production because that's our primary asset and that underpins our valuation. It is also a very low execution risk project in the mining sense, uh, you know, in terms of its location, access to infrastructure, where it is in Chile, access to skills, uh, all of those things that are required to successfully develop a mine are on our doorstep. So from that perspective, it's, it looks like a, a no-brainer from a development perspective, but we do really want to aggressively test the exploration potential around Maramaca and we think there could be potential beyond Maramaca and some of the news that will eventually come out, we hope will show that there's going to be other targets for us to follow up on. But so I think it's a mix. It's a mix. But but what if, what if you come in and, and if you change people's mind about how they should be approaching it? Because obviously they want to get into early production and that, that's a fine enough business model. If it starts throwing off some cash, it would allow exploration eventually. You're saying we can do th- both things concurrently. Is that the, is that the new news? So I think we can do it concurrently, but I would say it's definitely going to be a bent towards testing the expiration potential uh, as opposed to really hammering forward on the uh, on the development of Maramaca. So in terms of, if I was to say, we'll become more of an expiration focus in the coming 12 months just because we see so much opportunity to potentially completely change the scale uh, of this of this discovery and, and potentially beyond that. So more of an expiration focus, uh, but still moving forward. On well, I guess, so give, me the, give me the logic there. Why, why, has, why is the market going to react better to that than someone getting into production early? Well, I think uh, if we, so I'll give you an example. If we drill out the deep sulphide and there's a really exciting and economically interesting project there, we will still develop the oxide project first because that makes sense. It's very much lower capital cost to get into production and then use, use your cash flows to then develop a sulphide project. If, however, we make another Maramaca-style oxide discovery somewhere else in our claims package, then that could that could conceivably completely change the scale of the operation and how we would approach the development of, of those assets, uh, and we would have to go back and redo all of that work. And so, while we're you know while we're keen to continue to move forward, we're also keen not to waste money and then have to go back to the start and, and redo that work. Um, and so, we'll be doing bits and pieces that still need to be done. But there will be definitely a focus on on the expiration. Okay, so you're taking a chance and saying, okay, we've got something which is good, but we, if we find something similar, it could be world class. That that that's the, the the bet that you're making there. So in which case, how do you finance all of that? So where where are you at today? You've, you've explained the debt situation. What's the cash situation, and what do you need to spend to be able to deliver your exploration so, program? So we have about two million dollars left of the uh, money that we've drawn of that working capital facility. Another two million in liquidity. So call it four million US dollars in liquidity. Uh, obviously, not enough for us to go out and uh, do all of this work that we're talking about. Um, so I think uh, going back again, we have the benefit of having two large shareholders that will continue to write uh, large checks to continue to finance this project um, in terms of us moving it forward. So financing is not going to be uh, an issue for us. Uh, but the question is, what's the mix of the investors coming into that financing, and uh, who are we going to be speaking to? And um, there's been quite a lot of interest thus far. Why do, why, so why do you say they'll write checks? I mean, obviously, the copper is okay. We're up at around, around three bucks at the moment, but they've got to have a pretty strong view about what the future of copper price is doing to 
give that kind of commitment to you? So have they committed to you that they will write checks? I mean, I wouldn't say it's a absolutely uh, written in gold leaf commitment, but verbally, yes, both of them have said that there's uh, there's further money available to continue to push this project forward. Um, why do I say that? Because I think both groups see that at today's share price, this project is materially undervalued for what we have. Uh, they know obviously a lot more than the market does um, in terms of their, their knowledge of how advanced it is behind the scenes. Uh, and so while it's undervalued, they'll continue to be excited to put money in. That's kind of that's a really interesting point you raised. So they're you know, major shareholders and they've got more information than the rest of the market. Are they restricted in any way? So they are restricted in terms of their ability to buy and sell on market. Um, they, follow, they have very tight restrictions in terms of blackout periods, uh, all of that sort of stuff. Um, but they have preemptive rights in any capital raisings that we do. Right, okay. Why is it so thinly traded at the moment? Just a factor of uh, we've got a lot of sticky shareholders and uh, there's only about, so out, outside of Greenstone and Tembo and their LPs, uh, we've got another, call it 15 shareholders that speak for a significant chunk and their high net worths as a general rule. And they are very supportive shareholders. And so we have a very small free flow realistically um, in terms of the market, which is something that we'll look to, to remedy uh, when we go through the next phase of financing discussions. Okay. How are you finding working in Chile? Was it, yeah, how's that a bit of a checkered history? There are some big players there too, but what do you, what's your experience? Yeah, so the feedback, the groups that I've been speaking to, uh, you know, that's a question that they ask, what's going on in Chile? Talk to me about the social issues that are happening down there. And I had a long conversation with a with a with uh, an advisor who talks about political and um, social advisory in, in Chile before I joined just to get a sense of what's going on. And um, yeah, I think there's a there's been a change, and there's certainly been a focus on, uh, as there have been in many other countries around the world, in uh, people who feel that they've not gotten as much of the pie as they uh, would like to have, uh, have, finding their voice. I think the copper industry is incredibly important in Chile, and everybody there recognises it. And so, as a result, it tends to be um, business as usual. Though, and some of the bigger mines, they they have a few uh, labour relation issues. There's no doubt. I think where we're located and what we're trying to do is a very small project relative to the big historical operations there. It's in a pro-mining area of Chile. There's no doubt about that. Um, so we're very close to Antofagasta, very close to Mejiones. As a general rule, the feedback across the board there has been, been very strong, uh, but we go in with our eyes open. You know, all of the Every jurisdiction in the world comes with its challenges and Chile is no different. Okay. So, and this little bit of a question around the, you know, how you approach things technically um, as well. So, um, hopefully you can answer it. I know you haven't been there that long, but in, in terms of, again, how you apportion the capital spend for drilling with, you know, you can go and find oxide caps, which would be a nice quick uh, win. Uh, it's, it's obviously, you know, cheaper to mine, et cetera. But the big prizes are these sort of massive sulfite as well, sulfites as well. So, how do you say? Well, I, you're probably saying I need something for the market to kind of give them, give, make the conversation a lot easier now, and you can concurrently or at some later stage go chasing these massive sulfides. I mean, how, what's that conversation internally look like? So we're not really talking about what we're going to be presenting to the market per se. We're talking about a good process, a good geological process that we're going to follow. And Sergio, our geologist, is incredibly experienced and has found a lot of projects. So our focus is not on necessarily delivering news flow now to the market, but more focused on going through a good geological process to then identify targets that will follow up and drill. And now that that'll provide the catalyst that we need, hopefully it'll be successful. But, and, but you know what I mean? It, th- th- there's, a, there's a kind of good geological process that you can follow and it's boring uh, to the market, but it's absolutely the right thing to do technically. But because it's boring to the market, you don't see the same sort of interest, trading, appreciation than if you give them some little quick wins along the way. So companies have to do this dance to get the balance between, you know, what they go after. Because I assume you guys know a little bit about what you're going to be chasing and where it potentially could be and therefore where you should spend your time, money and effort, depending on what strategy the borders agree. So that's what I'm saying, you know. Are you having that conversation internally? Your needs are slightly different from the geo team. I think uh, they're actually quite aligned, really, because the, the the lowest risk targets for us to drill will be the best sources of future news flow. And so, you know, if we have potential shallow scout drilling targets for oxides, fantastic. We'll, we'll those will be prioritised. Uh, but 
you've still got to go through that first phase of geological work because you know there's nothing worse in geology than than rushing and uh, there have been plenty of people who have missed their targets by by rushing and not following a good geological process a good gating process to understand what they're doing so we're trying to fight that yes there is a i mean i've said it in meetings with this with the anomaly or the magnetic anomaly which is in the place where we think there's a sulfide target below the oxides the thought process is well let's just go bang a couple of drill holes in there and hope we get lucky uh, you know that's that's gambling and and that's increasing your risk of not hitting and so we are excited to go out and drill it but we're tempering that enthusiasm by saying we still need to go through the process there are other things that we can do to focus more uh, to focus in and reduce our risk we think um, and that will provide some news flow it might not be the high value you know catalysts of, of a of a an amazing drill result, but it will still be showing that we're narrowing down our targeting process and, and getting our minds set on what we're actually going to go and drill. Okay, so, me, so one of the articles I read was about the uh, extension of the option payment. And when I, when I read it, I thought your, your business must have been severely disrupted or you're one of the best negotiators I've spoken to in a while because the deferment of terms was for, you know, until, you know, next year in some cases. So, Tell us what has gone on there. How disrupted has the business been versus, you know, how did you manage to negotiate those terms in terms of the uh, the extension on those option payments? So I think when we negotiate, when we started cutting costs out of the business and when we started uh, to talk to our partners, and they are our partners, hence why they agreed to the, to the extension. We have a great working relationship with them. And um so that's the real reason that they agreed to, do, to take those extensions and then they got a little bit of an interest payment on top of that. Um, but when we started cutting cost out of the business, I don't think anyone had any idea how coronavirus was going to play out. I mean, it was completely unprecedented and we were trading at $1.25. Uh, you know, we, we were looking, staring down the barrel. We just paid an option payment. We were staring down the barrel of having to you know, raise money at a much lower price and I, I can tell you uh, our shareholders would not have been happy about that. So <clears throat> that was the reason we went into cost-cutting mode. Actually, when we look back, 2020 hindsight, we probably uh, we probably were too aggressive in the way we approached taking costs out of the business, but it was the right decision because, as we said, the board said on a call, we just have no idea what's going to play out here and our job is to protect uh, the capital structure and protect our current investors by doing whatever we can in the current environment. So... Actually, it hasn't been that badly impacted for us. There have been other, one of the benefits we have is we're not in operations. And so we don't have a huge team on site. So it's very easy for us to bring people back. A lot of our work going on the ground was on a desktop basis. And so it hasn't been anywhere near the impact that we thought, but we're still very thankful for our uh, partners in, in Chile uh, for allowing us those option ex payment extensions. Yeah, yeah, I think you did well out of that. Um, talk to me about the macro. Copper, obviously up around three bucks, hasn't been anywhere near that for quite some time. When you're having these institutional conversations, you know, there's research papers flying around in, in banking and there's varying views as to where it's going and the timing of it because of COVID. Um, what's your take on price? Um, so I'm a, I'm a copper bull in the medium to long term. Uh, in the short term, I had, again, I've, coronavirus had a what, what I thought the coronavirus impact was going to be didn't quite play out as much as I thought. I thought there would be much more of a su supply disruption, but when you look at the accounts of these copper producers, they're still producing quite a lot of copper. Uh, but then a surprising amount of demand coming back out of China. I'm hearing about them restocking and all of that sort of stuff. So, look, I think uh, from a company perspective, we typically are not sitting there trying to forecast how high copper is going to go, but we're looking at what happens if copper goes back down to $2.50 or $2.60 or, or, you know, around those levels? How does our business look at those levels and can we still get this thing into production and can we still be a going concern? And the, I think the great thing about the PEA that came out was it showed at $2.55 a pound copper where uh, we're still going to have an IRR north of 20%, which is just incredible in terms of uh, ranking ourselves relative to our copper peers. Uh, so medium, term, medium to long term bullish, uh, short term, I think I have as much idea as everybody else as to where it's going to go. Yeah, it's it's, it's interesting times. Um, but, but I guess what I'm trying to 
understand again is the the conversation it gives it gives a sense of the conversations that you are having around risk mitigation obviously you've you've taken a big chunk of costs out of the company back in in march and you've been quite aggressive with that but again you guys having a view of the future of copper also helps us understand what not just the risk mitigation components but the opportunities that you see in front of you you know will you go and raise additional capital over and above your current plans if you think copper is going to say four bucks, for instance, or oh, three fifty is more reasonable, but you know what I mean. I'm just, I'm just trying to get us into how big a part of the conversation yeah. is that each month at the board meetings. Well, there's definitely a, a, a general consensus at the board level that copper is is back, and uh, everyone's feeling a bit more excited about life now that we're back just above three bucks a pound, which is great. Um, and so that certainly brings a sense of excitement about, you know staffing up and getting ready for the next phase of development and going out and really chasing those exploration, putting those exploration dollars into the ground. Uh, the feedback, I guess, probably the better way to do it is to talk about the feedback I'm getting from institutional investors that I'm meeting. And, uh, you know, generally the consensus across them is they've made a lot of money in gold and uh, they're now looking for the commodity that they think is going to be the next one to go. And copper is it for, for everyone that I'm speaking to. Copper is uh, very high up on the list on on those co- commodities that they think is going to re-rate. Uh, I don't know whether or not I can see that as clearly as they can, but that's the that's the feedback that we're getting from the market. It could, it could be a good week for you. BHP's future commodity top three future commodities are copper, potash, and nickel. Who would have thunk it, eh? So good week for you. Uh, hey, look, um, thanks thanks very much for coming on and um, you know filling us in with the story here. Like I said, it's new to us and. Uh, enjoyed listening to that you've got a bit of work ahead of you for the rest of this year so looking forward to catching up again soon um, when you get some more uh, data out into the market from that drilling let us know for having me <laughs>